So welcome once again to Global Sociology Live. We are very pleased to have with us today Dr. Peter Evans, who will be helping us begin the second part of this series um, that will be focusing on global counter movements that emerge in response to the workings of unregulated markets and unfettered states. And Professor Evans is a professor of sociology and international studies here at UC Berkeley, where he's been teaching for well over 20 years. Um, and he's just returned from a meeting of the UN Research Institute on Social Development um, to be with us here today. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, among his many publications, uh, Dr. Evans is probably most famous for his two classic works, Dependent Development where he focuses on how the Brazilian state orchestrated capital accumulation, as well as embedded autonomy, where he uses a comparison of Brazil, India, and South Korea to try and understand the kind of state that most effectively promotes capitalism, the so-called developmental state. Um, his more recent work has shifted to focus on transnational social movements, and the ways in which they attempt to, to counteract the workings of neoliberal globalization by engaging in what he refers to as counter-hegemonic globalization. Um, and before uh, Peter actually begins, let me just take a minute and try and, and position his work in the context of, of this larger seminar, which, as you know, has two parts. In the first part, we focused on the global expansion of capital particularly in the terms of neoliberalism. We also looked at uh, global institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. And finally, we concluded by considering how states also attempt to expand their power globally. So the first part of this course has focused on uh, the kind of global reach of capital, states, and multilateral institutions. And now we move into the second part of this series where we'll focus specifically on the counter movements that emerge in response to these developments. And next week we'll be joined by Eddie Webster, who will be joining us from South Africa, to discuss possibilities for a global labor movement. But today we are enormously honored to have Peter Evans with us um, to begin this discussion on global counter movements. And we think that in many ways he's the ideal person to set off this discussion <laughs> uh, because despite the fact that he's done research on a wide variety of issues, his work always exhibits a very explicit concern for identifying movements that work towards alternative futures and for possibilities of, of mobilization um, among the subjugated. So in, you know, in the larger context of scholarship that often tends to heavily focus on laying out the problems of, of neoliberal globalization, Peter's work really stands out in the sense that it's always really got an eye out for, for possibilities for counter movements and, and mobilizations um, against these, these developments. So in, in his own words, he is a Polanian optimist. Um, very keenly aware of the range of economic, political, social problems facing our contemporary world, but always also simultaneously defending the idea that the world could be otherwise. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Evans. Thank you, Lale, for that fantastic introduction. I feel that I should probably quit while I'm ahead here and, and uh, just fold up my notes and, and uh, fade into the, into the distance. But uh, I'd also like to thank everybody who showed up at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon instead of uh, running off to start their weekend. I, I think it's admirable that uh, the kind of dedication that's evident there. And it's a real pleasure for me to uh, be back to be able to see you in the flesh as opposed to on my computer screen and to be able to uh, continue the conversation that we started several weeks ago, I can't remember exactly how many now, uh, with regard to Polanyi and the Great Transformation and why it didn't happen and why there is, why it is premature to give up hope of it happening. So, 
I'm sure by now you've gone over Polanyi so many different times that, that uh, uh, there is absolutely no need for my, me to uh, repeat this, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Um, and that is to say, we start out with Polanyi. Polanyi essentially talking about the demise of the neoliberal era and that demise as indicating the impossible project or the impossibility of the project of, sub of subordinating society to the self-regulating market, a project that in Polanyi's view had by logical necessity to end in chaos and catastrophe. For Polanyi, markets might be useful as tools for achieving society's ends, but as a self-regulating master institution, they were an impossible kind of project, as I say. And of course, as we said last time, Polanyi was clear that the world needed a great transformation. Where he was wrong was that he thought that such a transformation was not only underway, but was robust and likely to be fully executed in his lifetime. As it turned out, of course, the positive side of Polanyi's double movement, the movements for social protection, proved less powerful and less robust than he had hoped. And in the current era, it is clear that we need a great transformation more than ever. And it is clear, furthermore, that what we are getting, at least in the sort of major centers of global finance capitalism, that is the United States and the UK, what we are getting instead of a great transformation looks more like a great regression. And indeed, that great regression is based on an ideological caricature of the self-regulating market, a caricature that's so extreme that it would make Adam Smith and even Friedrich von Hayek roll over in their graves if they could view the policy pronouncements that are being made in their names. OK, so in this conjuncture then, it makes sense to ask, is a great transformation possible? And if so, what kind of ideological strategies, what kinds of organizational modes might be required to build a more powerful movement for social protection? And so it is in that spirit uh, that I have been working on this perspective that I call counter-hegemonic globalization. And in working on this, I've tried, first of all, to set out what I feel are the challenges that a movement for counter-hegemonic globalization would have to surmount if it were to have a chance to be successful. And obviously, almost tautologically, such a movement has to be organized globally. More concretely, that means that the movement must be able to overcome the political, ideological, and cultural divisions that separate subordinate groups in the North and in the South. It must be able to build unity across that North-South divide. Secondly, I argue that such a movement has to be able to transcend what some would call organizational silos. That is to say, such a movement has to be a movement of movements. It has to be a movement which can unite constituencies that are primarily focused on single issues and bring them together. What I would call a braiding of mobilization, a braiding together of these movements in such a way that they can support each other and work as a whole rather than as individual movements. Thirdly, I argue that in order to be successful, counter-hegemonic globalization needs to be a movement which is involved in multi-level contestation. 
That is to say, while it is essential that this movement include a global level, it cannot simply include a global level. The, uh, the proposition that all politics is local continues to apply. Local struggles are always where the rubber meets the road in terms of contestation. And, of course, the national level, the nation state, as you, I guess, have been uh, discovering, the nation state continues to be a central actor, and therefore movements at the national level are central. Okay? So counter-hegemonic globalization is not simply then a project of global movements, but it is rather a project of multi-level contestation. And finally, of course, to be successful, counter-hegemonic globalization needs to be able to capture the collective imaginary of people all around the world. It has to be able to convey a vision of what Boaventura de Sousa Santos, whom hopefully you will invite to uh, join you on this program at some point, uh, what Boaventura de Sousa Santos said, a vision of something radically better that is worth fighting for. Okay. So, is it possible that actually existing social movements might indeed surmount these challenges? Is it possible that counter-hegemonic globalization is more than a figment of my imagination? <laughs> well, of course, I like to believe that it is more than a figment of my imagination. And I do have some arguments to suggest the possibility that it is more than just a figment of my imagination. And first of all, I argue that globalization, that is to say generic globalization, globalization in the sense of the technological changes that shrink space and make boundaries more porous, that sort of G generic globalization has provided tools of communication, has provided possibilities for unity around the globe that social movements can use as well as the, their use by, of course, neoliberal global capitalism itself. Okay? So generic globalization, I argue, provides a repertoire of tools that movements in the past have never had available. And therefore, globalization itself increases the chance of a global counter-movement. I think that sort of is almost tautological. Secondly, I argue that the political economy of neoliberal global capitalism makes it easier for groups at different points around the world to perceive their shared interests and to focus on common targets. The obvious example of this is the global corporation, which confronts its workers all around the world. And of course, for those of you who have already read Eddie Webster, you've, you've got some examples of this. But the global corporation confronts its workers all around the world with similar kinds of challenges, similar kinds of oppression in the workplace, and similar kinds of exploitation in terms of falling real standards of living, even though you have a job. Second, as policy becomes harmonized, as they like to say in policy circles, as it becomes more homogeneous around the world, it becomes more obvious that in political terms, different groups in different places face the same kind of threats from neoliberal policies. And of course, the most obvious example of this is uh, the set of struggles that have occurred around the privatization of water. And I'm sure that in your spare time, you've uh, at least considered the possibility of looking at this very nice movie, Thirst, which looks at those uh, struggles. Okay. In addition, 
In addition, I would argue that the political face of neoliberalism, and remember that neoliberalism is, in the end, a variety of liberalism. How many, tell, tell me how many, I've noticed yes, Professor Burroway is, okay. <laughs> neoliberalism is a variety of liberalism. And liberalism has always had a certain kind of ambivalent, tricky sort of emancipatory facet to its political ideology. And I think that that sort of tricky and ambivalent but still emancipatory or still potentially emancipatory facet should not be underestimated. And I think it's fair to say that around the world, Ideas of rights, of human rights, of political rights, of democratic governance as the only really legitimate form of governance, and indeed of the expansion of rights to social and economic rights. All of those ideological trends around the world, I would argue, create new possibilities for mobilizing people around a project of counter-hegemonic globalization. Now, all of those things that I've just outlined are simply structural possibilities. Structural possibilities that create, in my view, an environment in which global movements have the possibility of overcoming those challenges that I outlined earlier. The other reason why I consider counter-hegemonic globalization to be more than a figment of my imagination is that we can find myriad concrete examples of movements around the world that are engaging in the kinds of strategies that I just talked about and mobilizing the kinds of, uh, of uh, resources that I just talked about. Now, obviously, I can't go into all the possible concrete examples. I'm sure we'll end up debating many of them in the, in the question period. But since I've been told that I will be wrestled off the stage at the end of my allotted minutes, I don't want to risk uh, going into uh, great detail on individual movements. But just let me say that... You've only got five minutes anyhow, right? Exactly, before, <laughs> before I'm tackled, so I better be very careful here. In any case, among those movements, in some ways I have privileged the global labor movement for reasons that I think will become obvious in a minute or two. The global human rights movement is, of course, one of the founding examples of a social movement that transcends national boundaries and the north-south divide. The global environmental movement is a movement whose growth was spectacular in the waning decades of the 20th century and continues to be very important. The global women's movement is also a movement which has transcended regional and local boundaries, and which has managed to build structures which bring together women around the world in a vast number of different <coughs> kinds of circumstances. There's lots of other examples we could go into. Movements of indigenous people are surprisingly global in the contemporary era. Peasants, once disparaged as having the political characteristics of a sack of potatoes, have managed to organize globally. Even slum dwellers, and indeed there's, there's, a, there's a host of other, other examples. But as I say, we can, we can save the, uh, the discussion of specific movements uh, to, the, to the question period. Now, does all of what I've just been saying mean that we're going to get the great transformation that we need. Is it clear from this analysis then that we can count on the great transformation as coming around sooner rather than later? The answer, of course, is 
absolutely not. That is to say that barbarism is always at least as likely as civilization, and in the current conjuncture, one would uh, have to uh, consider betting on barbarism, certainly uh, given what's happening, as I say, in the, uh, in the centers of uh, global capitalism. However, however, I think to assume that barbarism is our future is perhaps to fall into a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is to say, uh, I think that it is much more interesting and much more useful potentially to try to figure out concretely the ways in which specific movements might overcome the barriers that I talked about, analyzing victories and defeats, and figuring out what sorts of lessons might be learned from them. Now, there's one other thing that we at least should continue, uh, should uh, consider, and that is, are there perhaps alternative paths to getting to a great transformation? Now, if we think what, what are alternative, what's something quite different than counter-hegemonic globalization as I've outlined it, probably we would immediately think, hmm, how about the classic strategy? The classic strategy, of course, is to privilege the national level, to assume that the way to get global change is to organize national movements that are capable then of seizing state power, and that eventually the success of sufficient numbers of movements at the national level will generate a momentum that will create a global great transformation. Now, obviously, the national level remains tremendously important, and indeed, national movements remain tremendously important, as we have seen in recent months. But I would contend that national movements will not get us to a great transformation globally. And in making this contention, I'm going to sort of conclude here by going back to Polanyi and reminding you that at the time Polanyi was writing, it was the middle of World War II, at the time he was writing The Great Transformation, it was the middle of World War II. And anybody looking at the world in that period and asking what's wrong with the world would have said, well, clearly what's wrong with the world is militarism, is nationalism. What's wrong with the world is a series of political problems rooted at the national level, and therefore it is about national politics. And Polanyi, of course, said, no, in fact, it's about markets. It's about capitalism. It's about the ways in which markets have undermined society's ability to protect itself. And I would argue that Polanyi's analysis was in fact correct <laughs> and remains correct today. That is to say <clears throat> that in the end, global capitalism trumps national power with the perhaps important exception of China, which we might want to talk about. Why are you lowering your voice? <laughs> because that's sort of a secret footnote as opposed to a... <laughs> In general, global capitalism trumps national power, and as a barrier to the great transformation, if you can't change global capitalism, you will not get a great transformation. And therefore, as heroic as the people of Egypt may have been, that won't get us to a great transformation. As interesting as the Bolivarian revolution may be in Venezuela, it won't get us to a great transformation. And it is only through a multi-level contestation that includes movements organized at the global level that we have a possibility of getting to a great transformation. And furthermore, those movements obviously must 
ideologically attack the primacy of the self-regulating market as a master institution. It is not sufficient to simply attack repressive state power. And concretely, those movements must attack global capital and the power of global capital. Hence, counter-hegemonic globalization. Within my time limit, I believe. Very good. <laughs> You lay out a, you know, you provide a very good layout of sort of the, the process of what counter hegemonic globalization is going to look like. But I was wondering if, I feel like that um, one thing that wasn't very clear to me was the goal of it. And I feel like it's just sort of taken for granted uh, this kind of generic idea of, of a better world and social protections and this and that. But um, like we talked about earlier on during this course with Ananya Roy um, when she um, talks about the idea of poverty capital and critiques this idea of micro credit financing which had been kind of assumed to be a very you know um, easy and obvious answer that everyone could agree on to deal with global poverty and so I'm just wondering about if you could elaborate on what exactly the goal is of this movement of movements and particularly when considering this idea of trying to braid together different constituencies do you feel like there is a single goal that everyone you know all oppressed groups in the world can work toward together uh, the the sh the short answer is sort of uh, comes at that from both sides. On the one hand, we don't have, nor would we want to have, a blueprint <coughs> of what the consequence of counter hegemonic globalization, or for that matter, the consequence of, of progressive political action might be. On the other hand, I think that. Um, there are indeed some basic sort of propositions that people do agree on. And I think that while a, you know, a particular strategy like microcredit, well, it works sometimes. I mean, if you read my, uh, Ananya Roy, you know, at some points it's a revolutionary change for poor people. At other points, woo, maybe not. <laughs> Um, and so any sort of particular strategy or particular tr change is always going to be partial and therefore, you know, subject to further change. But I think that there are some sort of paradigmatic principles. And I think that equity is one paradigmatic principle that, in fact, most people agree with. I mean, you know, we could, we could debate, uh, you know, when people sort of, qualify or hedge their commitment to equity, but I think in general that's a paradigmatic principle that people agree with. I think actually that democratic governance is a paradigmatic principle that people would agree with. And that's not to say that, you know, multi-party electoral contestation is a, an institutional solution that delivers democratic governance. Um, but it is to say that the idea that decisions should be made in a way that reflects uh, the interests and are the considered and, and deliberated uh, interests and opinions of people, I think people pretty much agree with that. I think increasingly one could argue uh, that sustainability, that the idea that the human race has a certain stewardship responsibility for the planet, uh, and that to ignore that stewardship responsibility uh, sort of flies in the face of basic values that, that people agree with. So I think, you know, I think you can set out a set of paradigmatic principles that most people, most places actually agree with. And obviously, you know, specify how are we going to implement, you know, what does stewardship consist of in this area or that area? And, you know, is your stewardship the same 
as mine and so on and so forth. That's tough, but I think that, that uh, you know, there, there is a, a sort of a vision of what people want in general. And I think that vision, as I say, is being confronted now by a almost fantastic uh, opposite mirror image. <laughs> you know, what do you, what do, you do when, when, uh, uh, when people are, uh, are suffering from lack of jobs and, and declining incomes? Well, you impose austerity. I mean, hello. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, I think, if, I think if you compare the content of the policies of the Great Regression with the content of, you know, those sort of paradigmatic uh, areas that I've just outlined, there is a pretty, pretty big difference. And, and that it is a difference that is sufficient to provide uh, a, a mobilizing energy across, you know, a wide variety of groups around the globe. Can I actually just add on to that to, to ask, so, you know, insofar as the nature of the problem is, as you analyze it to me, and as Polanyi mm -hmm. also sets out, um, is very intricately linked to the workings of a market economy. Right. Is it fair to say then that the goal or the solution in some ways has to revolve also around some transformation when it comes to a market economy? Is that in Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think it's important not to slip into the idea that markets per se are evil. Right? I, I think we had this, this discussion last time I was here. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, being against bi bilateral voluntary exchange is like, you know, being against uh, social interaction. Markets can be useful tools as long as they are subordinated to social goals. So I think the point is not that we need to get rid of markets. It, it is that we need to transform markets from masters to servants. And of course, there's another feature. When people say markets in the contemporary era, they probably don't really mean markets at all. They mean capitalism, and they mean a system in which the ability to, economic, to allocate economic resources is not, in fact, embedded in markets in the sense of bilateral voluntary exchange. We hardly have any bilateral voluntary exchange left these days. What they're embedded in is a system of power in which people who have managed to appropriate uh, the right to control private economic resources work in conjunction with political representatives who also depend on those uh, economic resources for their political survival. And so it is really an ultimately hierarchical, authoritarian system, in a sense, that is called markets, but is in fact, in some ways, the antithesis of markets. So I think, that, I think it is quite important uh, to separate the sort of hierarchical power of contemporary capitalism from the idea of exchanging things that I have something that's worth more to you than it's worth to me, and so you have something that's worth more to me than it is to you, we exchange them and we're both better off. Um, and that kind of very, you know, bedrock sense of markets, I think, there's no reason to throw out the window. The question is, how do we turn markets into servants of society as opposed to turning them into the master of society and also how do we avoid using that ideology of markets uh, to mask what is really a combination of economic and political power uh, that is hierarchical and authoritarian rather than having anything to do with bilateral, voluntary social relations? Um, hello, thank you for being here today. Um, so in your article, you talk about how there's people or there's movements that aim at reducing state power, and you're saying that nevertheless the power of private capital remains the ultimate target. And previously when you were here, we, you also mentioned that targeting institutions like the World Bank, the WTO, and the IMF, which is not efficient in the sense that they were just a face of um, 
certain like private capitalist interest. So in your own words, if they, this could, if these both um, institutions can be like allies of private capital, what exactly in a concrete way is the power of, uh, or like private capital, how can it be best targeted and or, you know, attacked? Well, that is certainly the $64,000 question. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I would argue that while it is the case that targeting the bank or the IMF or various kinds of public institutions is only a proxy for the power of private capital, and while it is the case that targeting private capital is uh, way harder than targeting these vulnerable public institutions. It is still the case that targeting those institutions, conscious of the fact that, that they are uh, more symptom, symptom than they are the center of the problem, targeting those institutions is still quite politically effective. Because private capital does depend on its ability to make public binding rules, right? It depends on its ability to shape the rules by which markets work, to shape the rules by which global flows take place, to shape the rules by which trade takes place, et cetera, et cetera. Private capital does depend on its ability to shape political rules for its power, right? And so if you can deprive private capital of its political power, that's a big start. And if you can, in fact, uh, begin to exercise a political power which is contra the power of private capital, that goes even further. Right? So I'm, I, I'm not arguing that those struggles vis-a-vis -vis public institutions are a waste of time or useless or the wrong target necessarily. I'm just arguing that you have to realize that the power is one, the, you know, the sort of fundamental power is one step behind those institutions rather than if you could get rid of those institutions, oh, you'd be all set, right? Which would, that certainly is a mistake. And indeed, if you take this analysis, what that means is that global institutions like the bank and the fund, as is the case with national governments, Global, global political institutions are possibly separable from those private in uh, interests, right? In other words, you can, you know, the, 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 the folks who run the bank and the fund, well, their interests are connected with the interests of private capital, but their all interests are not necessarily sim uh, you know, synonymous with the interests of private capital. And indeed, the interests of individual actors within those institutions may be quite skeptical uh, of the behavior and interest of private capital. So you always have to look, you know, for ways of dividing uh, those that have power. And one of the ways of dividing those that have power is trying to figure out how to divide those whose power is exercised more directly in political fashion from those who are more purely private economic actors. Um, well, David Harvey argues that neoliberalism is a way of constituting and protecting class power, upper class. Reconstituting, yeah. I think, is what yeah. yeah, right. Upper class power. Um, but in your analysis, I feel that there's a lack, well, you mentioned labor movements, um, but I feel that there's a lack of um, emphasis on this question of class. And and I think my, my sort of question in that regard is, is, is this a movement that you envision that will also transcend the class uh, aspect, and and in that case, sort of, or what is the profile of the members that are in this movement? Are they transcending everything? It seems like that way sometimes. But how can they transcend class if neoliberalism is a way of protecting class interests? Sure. I mean, obviously, if you attack the power of global capital, that's another way of saying you're attacking the power of the global capitalist class. Now, I, th I think that when David Harvey assumes that neoliberalism is primarily the reconstitution of class power, he is 
ignoring the extent to which neoliberalism's irrationality in fact undermines even the ability of the capitalist class to uh, move forward its own project. And I think he also underestimates the extent to which the ideological moment of neoliberalism is while it is obviously linked to this idea of reconstituting class power, has a certain kind of independent momentum, which is, uh, again, separable from a sort of strict definition of class interests. I think here in the United States, we're, you know, we're, we're a sad uh, uh, country to examine in, for many reasons. But one of the interesting things about the United States is that it does give us some interesting windows on how neoliberalism works. And one of those interesting windows, obviously, is the Tea Party. And I think within, if you look at the Tea Party, obviously the connection to class interests is sort of uh, uh, painfully clear. But at the same time, the power of the Tea Party does depend upon that ideological uh, moment, uh, which is a very funny kind of, uh, you know, anachronistic uh, sort of 18th century version of liberal uh, ideology in a, in, a, in a kind of weird frontier uh, uh, manifestation. But I, I think you have to understand that ideological moment as well as uh, understanding the sort of specific connection to, to class interests. Finally, I would say that in my own view, it's a big mistake to overestimate the extent to which a class is a cohesive collective actor. And so therefore, you know, once we start talking about reconstituting class power, it's easy to sort of slip into uh, the uh, the idea that um, uh, you know these folks actually know what they're doing, uh, that they are are capable of acting in a coherent way, um, and that uh, that in fact I think overestimates their uh, you know their political strengths and the robustness of of their power. And finally, <laughs> I think that that. Uh, uh, in his sort of uh, effort to um, uh, unseat the hegemony of neoliberalism, David Harvey does have some tendency to uh, spread the, the uh, characterization of things as neoliberal uh, a little bit more broadly than, than I think the empirical evidence holds up and in that, in this case, I would say that uh, uh, that China is probably the best example. I mean, we can say a lot of things about China. I think to call China neoliberal is is probably an analytical error, and uh, you know that is taking certain aspects of the Deng Xiaoping transformation and sort of elevating them uh, to become the characterization of the entire. Uh, uh, Chinese political economy, whereas in fact, you know, there's China is a way more complex animal than than the uh, label neoliberal would would suggest. And indeed, I would argue that when you look around the world, you know, capitalism is everywhere, but neoliberalism, as it appears in the United States and the United Kingdom is actually much harder to find in a pure form. I mean, if we, if we look, I mean, even if, even if you look at, you know, France, well, is France neoliberal? Well, maybe, but uh, that's a little bit of a stretch. If you look at, you know, Brazil, is Brazil neoliberal? Well, you know, you can find, sure, they, you know, they charge outrageous interest rates and the banks make out like bandits and in this sense it looks like neoliberalism. On the other hand, the kind of neoliberal ideology you find in the Tea Party, very hard to, to, to find 
uh, in, in, in Brazil, except among the sort of most retrograde and marginalized segments of the old agrarian elite. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that it's more useful, in fact, to uh, uh, have a more restricted vir vir vision of what uh, constitutes neoliberalism in terms of figuring out what kind of strategies might be used to unseat uh, uh, the, the, the perverse and, and uh, regressive uh, consequences in neoliberalism. Hi. Hey. I'm just curious to what you think can be the potential or future role of sociology then in informing the development of this global movement. And that, I mean, now we all know a little bit more about some effective strategies, the four things that you mentioned that are useful into developing this movement. But how are other, how do other people, how are all these organizations that are going to be braiding together be informed about effective strategies and ways to organize? How do you think sociology can, can play a role in that development? Great question. Um, <clears throat> as as Lali mentioned, I'm I, I'm just coming back from this meeting of the UN uh, Research Institute on Social Development, and one of the things that struck me at that meeting, as tends to strike one when one is at sort of you know gatherings which have to do with policy, but which include a bunch of academics, um, one of the things that strikes you is the extent to which the discipline of economics is intellectually blinding to what sociologists consider to be sort of obvious, <laughs> um, you know, taken for granted kinds of assumptions about the way society and politics and, uh, and um, mobilization, et cetera, et cetera, works. And so I, I think actually sociologists much as they are disprivileged in the, in the status hierarchy of academe, sociologists are actually in some ways intellectually privileged because we start out from a presumption that society does exist, that social relations are important, in fact, that they're ontologically prior to individual preferences and, and individual behavior. And I think, I think those basic assumptions are tremendously valuable in terms of trying to counteract particularly the ideological moment uh, of, of neoliberalism. So I think that, you know, any time you have a conversation <laughs> with anybody who comes from, uh, you know, a different kind of disciplinary background, etc., that you are in fact uh, engaged in counter-hegemonic behavior <laughs> just by simply, you know, saying, well, you know, in my sociology class, what they think is this. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I think it's great uh, um, that uh, sociology is becoming a little bit more aggressive in terms of its, uh, uh, of its role. Uh, and I think this course, of course, is, uh, is an excellent example of that. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, yes, thank you so much for your lecture. And I would actually... Well, in your article, you're stating that the uh, social democratic regimes of the global south could actually, um, they have the vital interest in kind of um, replacing this set of global rules present today with another set that is more geared towards social protection. And my question is actually, is it possible that those countries of the global south are perceiving and seeing counter hegemonic globalizations as their chance to impose themselves as leaders, as northern countries did in the case of neoliberalism and globalization, so to see the counter-hegemonic globalization as an alternative to enable shift of power? I think that, that any sophisticated leader of a country in the global south, again, China is a separate category. You, you know, I'm sure you're going to have a, a, whole, uh, a whole discussion on China. But if we look at sort of uh, you know, countries like Brazil or India or South Africa or, you know, uh, sort of large and important but still more or less normal countries in, in, in the global south in terms of size and power. If you look at those countries, no sophisticated leader in those countries would have, I think, illusions that any of them or even that they collectively could engage in the kind of dominance in the world that – 
um, the, the countries which are now neoliberal in the global north enjoyed uh, in the past. But I, I would still stand by the proposition that for those countries, it is the cost of the global neoliberal rules of running the economy, the cost is more apparent than it is to governments in the North. And therefore, they are more susceptible to being pushed, being nudged by social movements at the national level, at the local level, etc., being nudged by those social movements uh, in uh, a direction which puts them in opposition to uh, the rules of global neoliberal capitalism. Thank you very much.